Welcome to A Walk with Jesus, Part 2, a Bible study from The Way, an independent Christian church located in Ocala, Florida. In our study, we will follow Jesus through the New Testament, from the beginning of creation to his birth, through his ministry, his death, burial, and resurrection, and beyond. And there are two ways you can enjoy and use this study. First, by simply listening to it and following along in your Bibles. Or you can listen with friends and use this as a home Bible study or a small group lesson. And don't forget to share this with your friends and contacts on Facebook and give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel on YouTube so you don't miss a lesson. So let's begin part two of A Walk with Jesus and turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 1. Luke was a physician, and his letter begins by documenting the births of both John the Baptist and Jesus and the relationship they shared. He then moves on and gives us an account of the life of Jesus and speaks of the faith some people had in him and the opposition his ministry will eventually bring. He speaks of those who will follow Jesus and those who wish to see him die. And he assures us through the resurrection that the son of God's mission on earth was to seek those who are lost. Let's look at verses 1 through 4. Since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke writes these first four verses in classic Greek, which was the mark of an educated man. And in verse 5, he changes back from classic Greek to everyday Greek, so everybody can enjoy his story and understand it a bit better. And these four verses tell us that he has investigated the life of Jesus and the events he is writing about. He tells us they have been passed down by reliable sources and eyewitnesses, and he wants us to rest assured that the story he is about to give has been verified and found to be true. He was also recording what he was involved with as well. He's talking about the things he accomplished in the name of Christ, which leads many to believe that Luke may have been one of the 70, that he may have been one of his disciples that Jesus sent out before him to proclaim his coming to every town and village along the way. In Luke 10, 1 and 2, this is what we read. Now after this, the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city and place where he himself was going to come. And he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So Luke may have been one of the 70. And others think he may have also been involved with Paul in at least one of his mission journeys. So from these verses, we can be certain Luke's gospel contains eyewitness accounts and information handed down to us by credible sources. Now let's look at verses 3 and 4. It seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. According to verse 4, Theophilus is a believer. He's studied and has been taught the truth, and he believes. So perhaps he's commissioned this account to better understand both Jesus and the events of his life. And so the first event in this story is the birth of John the Baptist, beginning in verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And yet they had no child, because Elizabeth was infertile, and they were both advanced in years. In these verses, we are introduced to three people, Herod, an extremely brutal leader that executed members of his own family who he believed might betray him and attempt to take his kingdom. Then, Zechariah, who was a priest, and his wife Elizabeth, who are both advanced in age, and she was barren without child. 
And Zechariah and his wife believed in God, and they were righteous in his sight, and they walked blamelessly in all his commands. Verses 8, 9, and 10 tell us, Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the customs of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. Now, this would have been a great honor, perhaps a -a once-in-a-lifetime honor for Zechariah ministering in the temple. There were thousands of priests, and the job fell to them by casting lots. So it's highly unlikely this honor would happen to any one of them, even once in a lifetime. So Zechariah, I'm sure, was excited and ready. Now, some people consider casting lots to be gambling, and it is gambling if that's what you're casting them for. But in this case, the Jewish people use lots to determine God's will. One of the most famous times casting lots is mentioned is in the book of Acts chapter 1. When the 11 remaining apostles cast lots to determine who God wanted to serve in Judah's place. Acts 1, 21 through 26 tells us how they chose him and the requirements that were needed for him to serve. Beginning in Acts 1, verse 21, Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and they said, O Lord, you know the hearts of the people. Show which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias. And he was added to the eleven apostles. Matthias was the apostle chosen to replace Judas. He had accompanied Jesus during his entire ministry from his baptism to his death, burial, and resurrection until the day he ascended. And with one of the twelve gone, this would have been important because Matthias could testify about the life of Jesus as an eyewitness. It also tells us that there were others that followed him, followed Jesus during his entire ministry from day one, others than just the twelve. And then in verses 11 through 17, we learned that an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zechariah was troubled when he saw the angel and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall name him John." You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice over his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while still in his mother's womb. And he will turn away many of the sons of Israel back to their Lord, their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of fathers back to their children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Let's look at these verses for a minute. It looks like the angel appeared suddenly in the blink of an eye, and Zechariah was afraid, gripped with fear. Angels are extremely powerful beings, messengers of God, who when first accounted grip us with fear. Almost every time an angel appears to someone in the Bible, the first words out of his mouth are, do not fear. But many people have the belief that angels are cute little chubby babies with wings. They keep small statues of angels in their homes. They study and sometimes worship angels. And it's a very dangerous hobby. We should never invite angels into our lives. Many people speak of their guardian angel. And while I'm sure angels have guarded us from evil for centuries, God has never specifically appointed one as our personal bodyguard. And I say this because when we get familiar with angels, we never know whose side they're on, who they follow. 
Some are ruled and follow God, and some are ruled and follow another leader who isn't God. And some disguise themselves in order to destroy us. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14b says, For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. The next thing I see happen here is that an encounter with an angel can bring us fear, but also it can bring us incredible blessings. In this case, it's a blessing of a baby. In verse 13, Zechariah and Elizabeth are told that their prayers have been answered. I wonder how long that they've been praying for this. At that time of a woman was barren, it was thought that she had sinned against God and that she was being punished. It would have been a disgrace to Elizabeth as well as the talk of the town. It would have been on everybody's lips and she probably received some strange looks from her neighbors. But now her prayer has been answered. And what stands out here for me is how long it took God to answer her prayers. It's a reminder that God doesn't work on our calendar. God waited for this moment in time because the birth of John fit into his plan. Now, not yesterday or last month or last year, but today. When we pray, we need to remember that. Just because God hasn't answered our prayers today doesn't mean he won't tomorrow. And we should never stop asking. Because when it's God's time, he honored them for their service to him. He honored them because of the life they lived and the faith they shared. And notice in verse 14 that many will delight over this birth. When God blesses one of us, sometimes we can all share in the blessing as well. If you're listening to this study in a group, now would be a good time to pause this lesson and discuss what we've covered so far. Discuss prayers and how they have or have not been answered. Have your answered prayers given blessings to you and others as well? Are you still waiting for your prayers to be answered? And are you continuing to ask or have you stopped asking? Give examples perhaps of how you've been blessed because of others who have been blessed. You can pause your lesson now. But for Zechariah, the opposite was true. Instead of bringing a blessing to Zechariah, his fear turned into disbelief. Verse 18 says, How will I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Zechariah is a God-fearing, God-serving man. He's visited by an angel from God. He's in the process of serving God in his temple. He believes in God but he can't get the world out of his mind because the world says, this isn't true. You've prayed for a son for years. Why would it happen now? The world says, this isn't true. Look at how old you and your wife are. This isn't true. Your shame is known throughout the land and God obviously doesn't care enough about you to answer your prayers. We all have those little doubts, but when we doubt and don't believe, we lose out on the joy of the blessings. And instead of rejoicing and praising God at this time and being filled with happiness, look what happened. In verse 20, the angel says, Behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled at their proper time. And while all of this is happening inside the temple, we learn that On the outside, in the meantime, in verse 21, the people were waiting for Zechariah and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. And he repeatedly made signs to them and remained speechless. And when the days of his priestly service were conducted, he went back home. Now there's a lesson in these verses as well, because when Zacharias came out of the temple... He would have stood in front of thousands of people, and it would have been his job to offer them a blessing. And we find this in the book of Numbers. After the priest came out of the temple and the sacrifice was over, he would stand and give them a blessing. Numbers 6, 24 says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his consonants on you and give you peace. 
This was part of the ritual, and the people would give a response and say, Blessed be the Lord God, the God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. So the sad part here is there was no blessing for the people that day and no praise given to God in return. You see, our doubts and fears and uncertainty rob us of our blessings, both of giving and receiving. Sometimes I wonder, how many blessings have I not received over my lifetime, and how many times could I have blessed others? Our next verse, 24, tells us that after this, after these days, Elizabeth became pregnant. Verses 24 and 25 tell us, now after these days, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked upon me with favor to take away my disgrace among the people. It's important to know that this pregnancy took place after these days. In other words, God wants us to know that while this birth was a miracle due to Elizabeth's age, it wasn't the virgin birth. John was not the awaited Messiah. John was a man because of a normal birth. Both births are miracles. Elizabeth and Zachariah are old, advanced in years, and having this baby was truly a miracle. But it wasn't the miracle of a virgin birth. That miracle was given to Mary, and this verse wants us to know there is only one Messiah, and it's not John the Baptist. And the last thing I want to mention about this is found in verse 24. And notice that when Elizabeth discovered she was expecting a child, She kept herself in seclusion for five months. That's always intrigued me because you would think that her first inclination would be to run out into the street and yell, God loves me, I'm expecting a child. Praise the Lord. But she hides herself away instead. Why do you think she would do that? Well, I believe the answer is to worship God, to praise and give Him thanks, and not be surrounded with negative people during this happy time. I think she understood that many people wouldn't believe her. They would tell her she was wrong, tell her God can't do these things and bring her down. She believed, so she rejoiced and praised God, which tells me two things. First, sometimes the blessings we receive give others joy. And second, sometimes they are to be enjoyed privately with our God. I believe she just wanted to be alone, near God, feeling his love and offering her praises without listening to negative, disbelieving people who would spoil her blessing. And when she came out of seclusion five months later, it would be apparent and beyond a doubt that her claim to such an incredible blessing was true. So this looks like a good time to end this week's study. And when you do, take a moment to reflect on everything you've learned about living a blameless life a life that allows others to see Christ in you as you walk in his commandments. Talk about the angels and the relationship they share with humans, the good things they do for us in the name of God, the blessings they bring and secretly give us, as well as dangers of getting close to them and giving them your worship. Talk about Zacharias and his disbelief and the blessings he lost because of his disbelief. And finally, discuss how God restored Elizabeth and took away her shame in verses 24 and 25, and how she worshiped him in return. Thank you for being with us, and don't forget to come back next Thursday for part three of A Walk with Jesus, and throughout the week for our sermons and devotions. You can find us online at thewayicc.org, or on Facebook and YouTube at The Way Independent Christian Church. And remember, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Abide in him. Jesus is the way. I'm Pastor Ray. Have a blessed week.